thank you very much. Um, the students who are performing um, were Mia Pinheiro, Molly Morgan, Ashley Knights Herney, and uh, um, Mrs. Olivia Malone. I'm sorry, I, I counted three and I forgot to get exactly um, who was, was here. But the choreographer was Laura Gordon, who's a former UVM student. Um, and I, I'd like to thank Laura for a, a, a wonderful uh, start to our symposium. So um, our next speaker is Stephen Meyer. I'm going to keep my introductions brief because as you can see from the program, we have brief bios already there of our speakers. But let me say that um, Stephen Meyer's uh, research is world famous for studying the behaviors that are caused by stress. Um, and he is going to be here to uh, tell us about stress coping, resilience, and the prefrontal cortex. And I'd like Stephen to thank Stephen for coming here. He's also our Macmillan Designated Scholar in Residence, and he's a distinguished uh, professor of psychology and Center for Neuroscience, which is the highest uh, accolade you can get at the University of Colorado. Thank you, Steve. Is, is this on? Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Um, you know, I've been asked to follow some tough acts while giving a talk. And, uh, uh, you know, this was unfair. <laughs> uh, I'd much rather have them do some more than listening to me talk. Um, but anyway, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's lovely to be here. It's been fun. And how do I make my slides? There we go. Um, it's been fun to be here. Uh, and again, thanks. Um, now, um, I was asked to talk for 45 minutes about stress, and I was told it's a very, very general audience. And it's, it's really very difficult to know what to do in, in 45 minutes um, and talking about stress. Um, just by way of orientation, so you know who I am and what my biases are, I'm a neuroscientist. I study things like neurochemistry in animals, very basic research, so, uh, so, pu so put that in context. Now, usually in talks like this, I've given lots of talks. I cannot tell you how many talks I've given. Usually in talks like this, the person giving a talk starts by trying to define stress, and I've always thought that's a great mistake. A, it's boring, B, it's impossible, and C, it takes half the talk, and you haven't said anything. So I'm not going to try. But what I am going to do is point out what I think you really all care about. You care about threats to you and your environment. You care about adverse, aversive events in your world. And you care about demands that you feel exceed your capacity to meet them. Now, <coughs> let's see. what I want to ask briefly in the time I have is what does this do to your brain and behavior? And second, we all know that some individuals are tremendously impacted by adverse events that occur to them, while others seem to be resilient and bounce back quickly. And so what's the difference? And I actually want to start with the second question because I think the second question will require me to illuminate the first a bit. Um, so say, You've been married for 30 years, and your spouse dies. Some people say, woe is me. I'll be lonely forever. There's nothing I can do. Whereas others will say, well, this is a devastating event. Of course, I'm miserable. But I don't have to be lonely forever. There are things I can do. I can join a church group. I can join the Sierra Club and go on hikes and meet people. Uh, all these things that I can do to eventually make my situation better. And so what, appear, so what has turned out to be critical from years and years of research is people's self-perceived ability to cope with the event in question. And at the heart of coping is the person's perception of the degree to which they have behavioral control 
over the circumstance that's occurred to them. The degree to which they believe that their own personal actions can influence the outcome. And it turns out it's those that believe they have the ability to cope and control the situation that are resilient. And it turns out it's those who believe they do not have the ability to exert control of the situation that are tremendously impacted and don't recover. And what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the research and the brain mechanisms that are involved. Now, the uh, interesting thing about behavioral control is that this is something that can be modeled in animals. And that's important because it's in animals where details of brain mechanisms can be studied. And so just to give you a very little brief uh, look at this, the way we study this in the lab. By the way, all I want to get across to you today is gist. I, I'm not going to go through data. I mean, occasionally I'll show you a little bit just because I'm a scientist and I can't help it. I have no behavioral control over that. <laughs> um, but I will do it very little. And only when I think it's kind of really illuminating. So really all I'm trying to get across is the gist of what we know. So, but I do want to show you how we study this in animals because I think it will give you some intuition about what's going on. And what you do is you see over here in a cartoon and over here in real life, you see three rats sitting in a little boxes with wheels at the front. And two of these rats have little shock electrodes on their tail. And so we can deliver occasionally brief electric shock to the tail. Now, the one thing to know, in case you're worried about these rats, is the, the current only passes between the two electrodes. So we're not shocking the whole rat. It's just a little spot on the tail. This is not painful in any, in, in any uh, meaningful sense of the word pain, but it's quite annoying. And so the rats would like to be able to terminate this event. And the way it works is every once in a while, these two rats, labeled escape and yoked, receive a little shock to the tail. And the shock stays until this guy, which we're labeling escape, turns the wheel. A few minutes later, a little shock comes on again, stays on until the rat turns the wheel. That rat has behavioral control over the termination of each of those shocks, right? The shock duration is determined totally by the rat. If it turns, it goes off. So it has behavioral control over that aspect of the situation. For the second rat, each shock begins at the very same time as for the first rat, the one labeled yoked. But turning the wheel does nothing. Each shock goes off for that rat whenever the first rat turns the wheel. So is it clear they're getting exactly the same physical events, right? They're getting the same physical events. The shocks are identical. But the one rat has behavioral control over one aspect of that event, its duration. The other doesn't have control, OK? It's like, it's like being told you have cancer. They're both told they have cancer. But one of them has control over an aspect of it, whereas the other one doesn't. And these are rats, mind you, not people. So if this is going to be important for the rat, then I think that's telling you something. If it's important for a rat, you know it's going to be important for people. And I will get into very similar experiments with people towards the end. The third, of course, gets no shock at all. And so you can determine whether any outcome of the stress, behavioral, neural, endocrine, doesn't matter, is determined by the event they experience, because these two get the exact same physical events or whether it's determined by the psychological dimension of control versus no control. Because the physical event is identical in every aspect. Now, it should be no surprise to you that aversive events like, oh, what did I just do? Ah. It should be no surprise to you. So, so behavioral scientists have developed all kinds of behavioral tests that are supposed to assess depression-like behavior and anxiety-like behavior. It doesn't matter what they are. They're listed here. It doesn't matter. You don't, don't even bother. And it should be no surprise to you that being exposed to stress produces these depression and anxiety-like consequences. Because we know in both animals and humans that aversive events produce depression and anxiety-like consequences. 
The important fact is that these only follow in the animal with no control. That rat that could turn the wheel, even though it's getting the same, same shocks, shows none of these. They are completely protected if they've had this element of behavioral control. So how does control block or blunt the impact of adverse events? How does it work? I've told you it does. I'm not going to show you data. Just trust me. Um, that's not the point of this talk. How does it do it? Well, the first question we have to answer is, before we can answer how control blocks it, we have to know how it is the aversive event produces these depression and behavioral-like consequences in the first place. And, you know, we've been studying the brain mechanisms that produce these for 20 or 30 years. Lots of transmitters and hormones and brain regions are involved. But the one that's critical to understand how control works is a brain structure called the dorsal raphe nucleus, DRN for short, and the neurotransmitter it produces, namely serotonin. Now, the raphe nuclei, for those of you who don't know, are located, are the serotonin-containing cells are located in uh, eight or nine clusters of cells in the midbrain. And two of these, B7 and B8, form the dorsal raphe nucleus. And this nucleus sends projections all over the forebrain and provides the serotonergic innervation. That is to say, when those cells are activated, they release serotonin in large, large parts of the brain. Now, oops. we know from lots of research that I'm also not going to bore you with that intense activation of these serotonin cells in this one nucleus is both necessary and sufficient to produce the behavioral and mood changes induced by adverse events. That is to say, we know how these, these depression-like and anxiety-like phenomena are produced by stress. Stress does it because it activates these serotonin cells in this region that then release serotonin in their projection regions. Now, again, I'm not going to show you data because that would take the entire time. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about this is you have to realize the dorsal raphe is a very, very small structure. It contains only 20,000 or so serotonin neurons in the rat and about 150,000 in humans. Now, the human brain contains, 2 billion is wrong, it's 100 billion. That's a misprint. The human brain contains about 100 billion neurons. So the serotonin neurons are this percent of the cells in the brain. A infinitesimally small number of cells relative to your brain. That tells you something important, which is one of the things I wanted to get across. The brain is not a democracy. It is often true that a minutely small number of cells are responsible for wide-scale changes. Just to put this in further context, some of you are probably interested in brain imaging with fMRI. So a single voxel in a brain image is about 2 million neurons. That is to say, the smallest number of neurons that can be discriminated by fMRI procedures is about 2 million neurons. And here, 150,000 are doing the deed. And I will let you think about that. <clears throat> so how can this be? How can the dorsal raphe nucleus do this? Well, three things you need to know. The dorsal raphe nucleus provides serotonin to numerous regions of the brain. How could it do it? It's got such a piddling number of neurons. The answer is each of these dorsal raphe neurons bifurcate, that is, divide, about 100,000 times. And so a single neuron from the dorsal raphe can innervate 100,000, can control 100,000. 
And it's also true that the dorsal raphe projects to the parts of the brain that control the various aspects of anxiety and depression-like behavior. So many of you probably know, at least vaguely, that the structure called the amygdala is very important for fear and anxiety, and the dorsal raphe projects to the amygdala and can modify its operation. And finally, the dorsal raphe receives inputs from a large number of other structures that respond to different aspects of stressors or to different types of stressors. So what you have in a cartoon form is something like this. And don't, I don't care if you know what these are. It doesn't matter. But the dorsal raphe nucleus receives inputs from a large number of other structures, each of which is responsible to a different type of stressor or a different aspect of stress. The dorsal raphe then summates these inputs. Because if you're in deep doo-doo, then you're going to get many of these inputs. And, th and the dorsal raphe will summate these all and say, aha, you're in deep doo-doo. And then it will project to all these other structures and saying, you're in deep doo-doo, now you want to be afraid, now you want to be all this other stuff. So we know, I know, how it is that bad stuff produces depression and anxiety-like behavior. Now, if behavioral control prevents all these negative behaviors, right? If having control prevents all these depression and anxiety-like behaviors, what logically does behavioral control have to do? It has to prevent the activation of this structure. If, if you're not going to get these behaviors, if you have behavioral control, then control has to block this activation. And therefore, you won't get the behaviors, right? And that's what happens. And here is where I can't help it. I'm going to show you one piece of data. I'm powerless to stop this. So if behavioral control is critical, what would have to be true? So what I'm showing you here, and I'm not going to tell you how we do this, is we can measure serotonin in wide awake behaving animals while they're walking around doing stuff, turning the wheels and whatever. And what I'm showing you is we're measuring serotonin. And you know, it's all steady. And here's where the stress starts. As soon as the stress starts, serotonin shoots up. This nucleus is becoming tremendously activated when there's stress. If they have no control over the stress, that's the uh, IS, they have no control over the stress, serotonin stays up. But remember the animals who could turn the wheel? That's the dark circles. As soon as they learn, ah, turning the wheel gives me behavioral control, look at what happens to serotonin. It drops like a rock, even though the shocks are continuing. The shocks do not bother that animal if it has behavioral control, at least as far as the dorsal raphe is concerned. <coughs> So how does this work? How is it that the dorsal raphe becomes inhibited during stress, even though the stress is there, if you have control? How does it work? And making 20 years of research into one slide, because <laughs> um, that's not the point of what I'm doing with you today, is to show you how I got there. I'm just telling you the goods, right? That's what you care about in this kind of audience. A small region of the medial prefrontal cortex, in the prelimbic cortex, this is sort of a s slice of a rat brain, here's a human brain, so we're talking up here at the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. A small region in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex detects that you have control. And then neurons from this region that project down to the dorsal raphe nucleus inhibit it. It's as if the medial prefrontal cortex says, cool it, dorsal raphe, we have behavioral control. Cool it down there. <coughs> so the model is sort of like this. I already showed you this part. All these stress inputs are driving the structure, which is driving the behavior. But when you have behavioral control, there's top-down inhibition from the medial prefrontal cortex saying, stop dorsal raphe. Put a break on it. And the way it works in cartoon form is that there are glutamate excitatory pyramidal cell outputs 
from the ventromedial prefrontal cortex up here down to the dorsal raphae in the brainstem, and these excitatory inputs synapse on inhibitory neurons that then inhibit the GABA cells. Say, stop. <coughs> so, how do we know that the presence of control activates cells that descend from the prelimbic cortex to the dorsal raphe? How do we know that? Just a little logic here. So here is a cartoon of a neuron. The cell bodies up in the prefrontal cortex, goes down, and the axon terminals are in the dorsal raphe nucleus. And so what we do is we inject a retrograde tracer here. Since it's retrograde, the tracer is taken back up to the mid prefrontal cortex. And we can label then all the cells in the prefrontal cortex that project to the dorsal raphe. And then we can say, which of th are these activated if there's control? So what you can see here is here's the retrograde tracer um, in the dorsal raphe. Uh, here's, pre here's the prelimbic cortex, a slice of tissue. Every cell that's red is one that projects because we've labeled it retrogradely. So all, the, all, these are, all, these are, all these red things are cell bodies of neurons that project. We can then simply ask which ones are activated by looking for the expression of immediate early genes in those cells that are a function of neural activation. Um, and they are black dots. And so, for example, here is a cell that projects and has been activated because it's labeled and it's expressing the immediate early gene. And then we just count. And I will tell you without showing you that, in fact, behavioral control activates that pathway. So, because we demonstrated it directly. That's what neuroscientists do. Um, so how do we know that activation of this pathway from the prefrontal cortex to the RAFA is critical in the mediation of the protective effects of control? Well, because if we use clever neuroscience tricks to take this pathway out of the circuit, control no longer protects you. Right? So we can give animals control, which would normally protect them, but if we take this part of the circuit out with clever neuroscience tricks, they're not protected. Now they suffer just as if they didn't have control, even though they do. It's that single pathway that's critical. That's the way the brain works. It works by pathways. I'm not going to show you the data. Forget it. I, I was going to be weak again, but I'll be strong. <laughs> um, conversely, if this pathway is really critical, what would happen if we gave you the bad event, the uncontrollable stress? We take you, we give you uncontrollable stress. But, because we're clever neuroscientists, we activate this pathway with clever tricks. Should you be protected? Yeah, and you are. We've done all those experiments. It doesn't really matter if you have control or not. It matters where that pathway is activated. And control is what normally activates it, but since we're neuroscientists, we can do it cleverly. So, actual, I just told you that already. Actual behavioral control doesn't matter. What matters is whether that single pathway is active or not active. Now, <coughs> you now know at least the gist of how it is that having control protects you, right? Because I told you, and you believe me, because you're good people. And I don't lie. Ho, ho. However, if you're interested in resistance and resilience, you should also care about how that experience affects how you respond in the future to stressors, right? Other stressors, right? Isn't that what's really critical? So we've done lots of experiments where we give an animal either the controllable stressor, an uncontrollable stressor, or nothing. And sometime later, typically seven days, we give it another stressor. Say, what happens to their response to the second stressor? Can you all guess? If their original experience was one where they had control, it blocks the negative effects of the later stressor, even if it's uncontrollable. Two things to know about this. This effect is quite enduring. Seven days is just what we do in a typical experiment. It lasts a long time. And if you give that control experience during adolescence, it lasts forever. 
in rats. <laughs> and maybe people. The other thing you have to know is that this immunization, this immunizing effect of having control is transsituational. That is, learning you have control over shock if you're a rat doesn't just protect you against shock. It protects you against things very, very different from shock. For example, social defeat. So this is a quite a general kind of effect. How does it work? You already know the answer. Think about it. Remember, we showed that if you have control, these prelim, let me see if I have the right, no. So if you, remember I told you, if you have control, then you don't get activation of this, of this DRN. Well, the bottom line is, if you've had a previous experience with control, then even the uncontrollable stressor fails to produce this rise. Okay, sh I can show you that just because I have actual data. So here is what happens to the dorsal raphe nucleus, what uncontrollable stress normally does. But here's what it does, the red, if you had previous experience with control. The dorsal raphe nucleus doesn't become activated by the uncontrollable stressor if a week earlier you've had control. How does that happen? How could it be that this highly stress-responsive structure, the dorsal raphe, is not activated when it normally would be? How could that happen? Well, remember this circuit? Remember when you have control that activates this descending pathway and inhibits the dorsal raphe? Well, what if having control changes the neurons in this pathway in some fundamental way so that now even uncontrollable stressors activate that pathway? That is, what if that experience with control over a potent negative event fundamentally alters those neurons such that now even uncontrollable stressors activate them? Then you'd be protected, wouldn't you? Remember, it's activation of this pathway that protects you. And if that prior experience now makes this responsive even to uncontrollable stressors, then you'd be protected. You'd be resilient, right? And that's exactly what happens. Is it obvious to you what the first experiment is you would do if you had that hypothesis? I'm not going to show you the data. I already showed you earlier how you can tell if this pathway is activated, right? You put a retrograde tracer here, it labels the neurons up here, and then you see if they're activated by looking at immediate early genes. Well, so you do that experiment, right? Normally, uncontrollable stressors would not activate those cells but they do if you've had prior control. Those neurons have been fundamentally altered by your experience of control. <sighs> now, how does that happen? So the manner in which these prelimbic prefrontal cortical to DRN neurons behave is altered by prior experiences of control over an aversive event. They act as if the uncontrollable stressor is controllable. It's the illusion of control at the level of brain chemistry. Those neurons act as if there's behavioral control, even though there isn't, if you've had prior control. How does this happen? Well, I joked about this yesterday in a talk. Um, <coughs> uh, you know, neuroscientists are weird people, and they, you know, I, I told this joke, it's not a joke, but, you know, we go to meetings, and at the bar we go, Psst, neurons that fire together wire together. So that, that's something neuroscientists like to say. But the idea is, this is how learning happens in the brain. If two sets of neurons are active at the same time, the connection between them is strengthened. That standard Hebbian kind of principle that you all learned about at some point. So let's say, conceptually, we have a set of neurons that are activated by or represent stress. And we have the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Well, we know what activates these neurons that represent stress. Stress does, right? We also know what activates the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Behavioral control, right? So if you experience control over stress, both sets are activated, and so the connection between them strengthens. If you have stress without control, only the stress neurons are activated. So they're not both activated at the same time, so no connection forms. 
the idea clear at, at this kind of cartoony global level? <coughs> sure. So if that idea is true, I have a few questions for you. This is test time. So should simply activating the prefrontal cortex produce immunization? Let's go back. I know I can go back. Okay, if we give, if we simply activate the medial prefrontal cortex, electrically, chemically, should you be immunized? No, you need both, right? They won't wire together if I just activate the prefrontal cortex, right? So the answer is no. You shouldn't get immunization if you simply activate the pre and you don't. How about if you gave uncontrollable stress, the bad thing, but activated the prefrontal cortex chemically during the experience? Should you get immunization? Re yes, and you do. Now you're resilient. So even if your initial experience is with the bad one, the uncontrollable one, if I activate the medial prefrontal cortex at the same time, you're golden. Because then you get wiring together, right? And, whoops. And thirdly, should experiencing control over any old thing be enough? We all experience many instances of control all day long. So why are we not immunized against negative events? You had control over your coffee this morning and control over the donut you ate, and, right? Why aren't we immunized? Let's go back. Because it's not just control. It's control in conjunction with something very bad. <laughs> All right. We're doing really good on time, by the way, so you don't need to worry. Um, so let me summarize. Actually, I don't want this slide. I don't want to summarize. Never mind. Th this is an older version. I don't want this. I wa what I want to switch to, so we're not going to summarize at this point. What I want to switch to is say, OK, this is all rats. How about humans? OK? So there is now a lot of human research. So there is the title of a paper. And it just shows that if you get, humans get a painful event, if the person is made to think they have some control over that event, even if the control is not real, this reduces the neural response to pain. And the perceived pain response, people feel less pain. Um, more interestingly, there's a recent paper, there's the title, that repeated our exact experiment in humans. They took some humans and gave them behavioral control over something very bad. Others got a yoked experience with something bad, just exactly like we do it, so the phys they're physically the same. And they manipulate control, and they do it in a brain scanner so that they can look at some of these circuits. You know what the aversive event was they gave to people? They used a subject who had snake phobias. And the aversive event was exposure to snake uh, videos and pictures. You can imagine that's very anxiety producing if you have a snake phobia. And you can imagine how they gave some people control without me going into details, the equivalent of my rat turning the wheel. It's pushing a button, right? And they have other people with yoked experiences, so they're getting exactly the same exposure. The result was that anxiety produced by the snake was massively reduced in the subjects with control. And that the reason anxiety was reduced, because they were in a brain scanner, is because the amygdala responding to the snakes was reduced because the amygdala is critical for fear. And the reason the amygdala response was reduced is because it was inhibited by the immediate prefrontal cortex. So in the subjects who, with, who had control over the snake, ventromedial prefrontal cortical activity went way up and, hip, and amygdala activity went way down. And the amygdala activity went down because of the medial prefrontal cortex. The exact same findings in humans. Um, more generally, there's been a lot of recent interest in the regulation of negative emotions in humans. <coughs> and this is usually done in experiments with cognitive reappraisal where people are taught or asked to reappraise the meaning of the event. So for example, uh, you might be shown a picture of a snake, and in, in the condition where you're to told to reduce your negative emotion, you're told, 
yeah, it, you know, when you see a picture of a snake, just think, oh, well, it really can't get at me, and it's really not a very big snake, and it's really not poisonous anyway. And some people are a very able to reduce their negative emotions. And of course, in these experiments, they measure all the physiological stuff, so they know how upset you are. And some people are very good at making themselves less upset. And what they see in those people is increased ventromedial prefrontal cortical activity and decreased amygdala activity. The way they are able to reduce their negative emotion is by increasing the top-down inhibition from the medial prefrontal cortex to these stress-responsive limbic and brainstem structures. Um, here's a quote from a recent review by Ray and Zold. I'll kind of read it to you, although I hate doing that. But they say, these investigators either implicitly or explicitly describe emotion regulation as the deployment of top-down cold cognitive control regions of the prefrontal cortex to down-regulate bottom-up hot reactive processes involving the subcortical limbic regions like the amygdala. Failures in the successful deployment of prefrontal cortical top-down cognitive control mechanisms or overactive bottom-up amygdala processes have been proposed to contribute to several forms of psychopathology. <coughs> now, the work I've told you today in rats also articulates very well with recent work on studying the brain mechanisms of affective and anxiety disorders in humans. Both involve medial prefrontal cortical dysregulation. In all of these, you get limbic hyperactivity and medial prefrontal cortical hypoactivity. It's as if the reason these people are so anxious and depressed is because they've lost that medial prefrontal cortical control over these stress responsive limbic and brainstem structures. So you get hyperactivity of those. There are a bunch of references there. And um, I actually think this kind of conception may explain, at least partially, the effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy and why its effects are so enduring. In cognitive behavior therapy, you're taught to identify the thoughts and images that lead to aversive emotional reactions and to examine and reevaluate the validity of these beliefs. Now, from my perspective, that's teaching you a method of behavioral control over your negative emotions. What are you teaching somebody in cognitive behavioral therapy, from my perspective? You're teaching them, we're giving you something you can do so that when you experience these negative emotions, you can reduce them. That's like turning the wheel. <coughs> and I would argue this will now activate that medial prefrontal cortical top-down inhibition. And uh, Joe DeRubis, who's a clinician, has recently made just that argument. What I would add here is what did I show you happens when you, when you uh, induce this top-down inhibition? You have plasticity in the system. And behavioral cognitive therapy, in fact, appears to be quite enduring. And it's maybe because, in point of fact, the cognitive behavioral therapy sessions are inducing plasticity in that circuitry. So that now, bad events activated, whereas before, they didn't. Um, <sighs> the last thing I was going to talk about, well, the next to last thing, was how this is adaptive. I may not do that, given I have four minutes left. Uh, trust me, I think this is an adaptive arrangement um, because, because it's as if the system, once having experienced control over a very potent event, is biased towards controllability being present in the future. And I think environments tend to be fairly stable. And so if in evolutionary time, you're in a situation where there is controllability that's likely to persist. And it would be highly adaptive then uh, to anticipate control in the future because that would uh, facilitate continued active coping. Last point, and then I'm going to stop and timing is going to be just perfect. Clinical significance. So strengthening, if you followed what I've told you, and you should, because I made it simple, Strengthening of these pathways would lead to reduced passivity and withdrawal and the emotions that drive passivity and withdrawal, such as fear and helplessness. So if part of resistance and resilience is the maintenance of active coping in the face of adverse circumstances, then teaching individuals that they can influence what happens to them, how they feel, and how others see them 
might alter how they respond to future adverse events in the direction of resistance and resilience, but not because of voodoo, because of the neural circuits that regulate behavior and the impact of these things on discrete neural circuits. Thank you for your attention. I'm not going to do a, a thank you slide <laughs> with granting agencies and all the rest of it, because this is not the kind of appropriate place for that kind of slide. So I won't. Uh, I think that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> Two minutes left. Thank you very much.